What a thrill. Thank you. Thank so, you. So um, I have this I found. This was in my library. Thank you. I have been reading your books and um, embarrassed to say listening to your cassettes back in the 90s. Yeah, wow, well, we yeah. really are old friends. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, I guess for the people that aren't, don't uh, know who you are, who is Marianne Williamson? Well, I'm currently a candidate for the Democratic nomination for President of the United States. I have had a 40 year career in writing books like this. Um, and you know, it's interesting being here in East Palestine because I, I have a, a career that has been based on working with people, moving through challenges in their lives, up close and personal. Being in East Palestine brings home how often the despair that we experience is due to bad public policy, bad economic policy. Um, this is not a, a, let's say, if someone in a cancer zone or in a sacrifice zone um, has a cancer diagnosis, it's a different issue than a cancer diagnosis elsewhere because you can't ignore the fact that there are larger social, political, and economic forces that are at play there. So being here today is um, very, it's a little devastating because while I haven't heard anything I didn't intellectually know already, the emotional impact of hearing people t share their stories is quite something and very humbling and very harrowing in a way. So in <clears throat> some of your teachings, you said um, where there is injustice, there can be no peace. So I'm not sure if you're aware, one of the things that happened here during um, the whole uh, derailment and when they called us back they said it was safe to come back into town Norfolk Southern instead of cleaning up their mess laid their tracks over contaminated liquid and soil um, it would be disingenuous <clears throat> of me to say I don't live with all the amenities that we have now and all the conveniences how do we balance profit and industrialization and um, <clears throat> progress with health and well-being of not only the community but people. There is such a thing as righteous profit, but righteous profit is not based on the exploitation of workers. It is not based on disregard for the health and well-being of people and animals and the planet and communities. That's not righteous profit. You know, Adam Smith, who was the main architect of the entire philosophy of free market capitalism, said free market capitalism cannot exist outside an ethical context. So that's the answer to your question. You, you're in business, you're in business, but you have ethical standards mm -hmm. and you don't sacrifice your ethical standards for your business. You know that you can, you can make a, a, a righteous profit, you can make a nice profit in a business where everybody wins. Yes. You win, your employees win, your, your customers, your patients win. But these huge corporate entities have so swerved away from any kind of moral or ethical center. And in an appropriate society, when, when government is doing its function, there are appropriate guardrails. And if any uh, corporate entity decides, well, uh, I don't want to behave ethically because to do so would undercut the bottom line financially of profit from my stockholders, then it's government's role to say, no, you're not gonna do that. Mm -hmm. Because we're not a government of the corporations by the corporations for the corporations. We are government of the people, by the people and for the people. Business should not be at the expense of the health, well-being, and security of the American people. That absolutely, uh, we, we've, uh, uh, at our best in this country, we've pushed back against that kind of nonsense. And it's time for us to push back again. Yeah, does it really have to be either or? <clears throat> no, no, there is such a thing as righteous profit. And anybody who has, let's say, a small business and can see this at work, I'm a writer, okay? So I put in energy uh, my, uh, and I invest my energy in my skill. The publisher puts, uh, invests their energy, their skill. And then a customer, someone who writes the book, uh, invest their money and walks away with value. So in a system which is an appropriate economic win-win, Everybody puts in and everybody walks away with a win. This is not what's happening, however, in what's called hyper-capitalism, vulture capitalism, mm -hmm. crony capitalism, whatever you want to call it. But it is a product of an economic paradigm that has taken hold of our 
country over the last 50 years where it has been deemed reasonable to transfer a huge amount of wealth into the hands of a very few people on the basis that if the corporation's only fiduciary responsibility is to its stockholders, then you're, you're entitled to squeeze everything you can yeah. out of the workers, out of the land, out of the people's lives. This has had a devastating effect on our society. Uh, what has happened here in East Palestine is a, is a ground zero embodiment of the problem. When this huge corporate entity not only creates a disaster, a preventable disaster mm -hmm. for no other reason than you weren't listening to the workers, you were saving money on your brake system, you were saving money on your on your warning systems. We all know what happened here. And then adding insult to injury and adding injury, further injury to that insult, you don't even clean it up. You do things afterwards that actually only make things worse. And when we say make things worse, we're talking about cancer rates. Yeah. We are we're not talking about a little inconvenience. We are talking about a system that is so out of control. This is not righteous capitalism. We're talking about a malevolent strain of capitalism that is um, it's soulless. It has no ethics. And uh, it, unfortunately, it has its tentacles in so many parts of our lives at this point. People are standing up. And I think this is a moment of awakening. And I think, unfortunately, what has happened here in East Palestine is part of that awakening. So um, to use a comparison with the trains just steamrolling <clears> through <throat> with this problem where corporations put profit in front of everything, how do you battle something like that? Well, you elect people. You elect people who are not in the government in order to dismantle the government. You elect people who realize that this has been a 50-year aberrational chapter of American history. It was based on a lie, this whole trickle-down theory, you know, with, well, if you make it just easier for the very, very rich to make a lot of money, they'll be the job creators, and then all that good will trickle down to everybody else. Well, clearly, after 40, 50 years, the jury is in. It not only lifted all boats, as they said it would, it has left millions of people without even a life vest. And at this point, it has been at the expense even of people's lives. We don't have universal health care because of profits for insurance companies. We have people rationing their insulin because of profits for mm -hmm. pharmaceutical companies. We have toxins in our food, in our air, in our water uh, because of chemical companies and, and food companies and agricultural companies. And we don't have common sense gun safety laws because of profits for gun manufacturers. We, we're not... Uh, fighting climate change because of profits for oil companies, and we are, we are in too many ways um, uh, carrying out our foreign policy, at least certainly clear times in the past, where that foreign policy has been dictated more by profit-making goals for defense contractors than by a legitimate security agenda. American people are waking up. Everything I've just said now is the bad news, uh, but what's the good news? You elect people who are willing to name it, and are willing to take this country back uh, to where we need to be, where public policy does not just allow for the very, very rich to more easily get even richer mm -hmm. at the expense of other people even being able to survive in an unjust system. We need to elect a different kind of person, and uh, that includes a different kind of president, and I hope that some people will consider that that be me. I'm sure a lot of people will. Thank you. Um, lastly, in times <clears throat> like this, when... So I think you're gonna, you're gonna hear some stories in a few minutes. Yes. And unfortunately, some of uh, quite a few of these patients have actually tested positive for some of the chemicals that were on the train, vinyl chloride and benzene. And people that would not normally have a voice or find a voice, uh, they found it now because um, is what what has happened to their town. And people that are usually very quiet um, are now speaking out. And um, what would you not just for a tragedy <clears throat> like this, but people. Um, all over the, the country that are going through times maybe similar, um, what advice can you give them to kind of uh, give them hope, pick themselves up, and just uh, keep moving on and just fighting? It's so important um, that we remember that we're not the first generation to be through go through challenging times. I'm sure there were desperate days for abolitionists. There were desperate days mm -hmm. for women suffragists. There were desperate days for people in the civil rights movement. And I'm sure that there were days when people wanted to give up and other people said, you can't, you can't, we got to keep pushing, we got to keep pushing. Um, the trend in America that we, is that we do tend to course correct over time. We did respond to slavery with abolition. We responded to the institutionalized suppression of women with the women's suffrage movement. We did respond to 
um, segregation with the civil rights movement. It's simply our turn. And I, what, what concerns me is what you just um, described. My concern, and really I think one of the reasons I decided to run for president, people are starting to spiral down. We can't let that happen. It's like, you know, uh, when people freeze to death, uh, what happens is they start to fall asleep. And we've read so many stories about people who are, let's say, lost in blizzards, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Somebody we've got to fall asleep and the, and the person with them, <laughs> don't go to sleep, don't close your eyes, don't close, we have to do that with each other. Don't go there, don't go there. We hold each other up at times like this. And I also think, like you said, people are finding their voices. People are finding a kind of solidarity with other people in things like this. You know, there's a line in the Bible, what man, what man intends for evil, God intends for good. There's something good out of uh, coming out of all this too. Yeah. You know, we're living at a time we're watching as one world is just sort of crumbling in front of our eyes simultaneously and something new is struggling to be born. We can feel that too. The very fact that you and I can have this conversation and let's also remember as many problems as America has, let's talk about the things that remain for us to celebrate. There are some countries where you and I couldn't even be having this yes. conversation and putting it online. So. Uh, we're in the middle of the drama now, but uh, even being in here in East Palestine, even though I have been reminded of the terrible, uh, terrible behavior on the part of a uh, corporate entity, I've been made aware of some very neglectful behavior on the part of government, but I've also seen the best in human beings sharing their stories. Um, sharing their care for one another. I think we know that something terrible occurred here, but I think a miracle is possible too. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you. It's been a real thrill. It's thank kind of you. surreal having you here. So. Um, well, you're a real hero in this uh, in this whole area, and uh, it's nice to actually meet you personally. Well, I'll accept that, but I don't consider myself a hero. Well, so, you but, but you, you you are in this place where it just so happens that your skill and your ability and your expertise and uh, your various resources can be of deep service. How fortunate for you. Well, thank you. And thank lastly, you. before you go speak, <clears throat> can you sign my book? Yes, I'll be glad to. Uh, so. <clears throat> Do I say for Richard uh, or for you know, Dr. T? I only went by Richard when I <clears throat> was in trouble for my mother. So okay. if, if Rick would be good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so Thank much. you, Marianne.